Now we're going to talk about what actually makes a great dissertation or thesis and how it is I got the highest honors on my undergrad thesis and a distinction on my master's dissertation. Hello everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Kaylin. I'm a first year PhD student in history and African American studies. Today's video is all about writing a dissertation or thesis. My experience stems from having written an undergraduate honors thesis while I was at UCLA and then writing a master's dissertation while I was at Oxford. Since I'm only in the first year of my PhD program, I have not yet written my dissertation for my PhD, but I will be documenting that journey as I chart down the path of this PhD. So make sure to stick around in case you want vlogs and study content as well as informational content about graduate school, research, funding, and everything in between. With that being said, today we're talking about dissertations, honors theses, independent research projects. This is not just about writing a research paper, it is about writing a sizable piece of literature that is going to contribute to public knowledge and the field in which you study. But I have a lot of tips for you all and I want to make sure that we get through all of them. So I'm going to go ahead and get right to the point. The first thing that we're going to talk about today is selecting your topic. The one question I get asked a lot is how you actually discover your research question. And oftentimes my answer is just to go beyond the readings that you were doing in class, ask questions and be critical about what you are interacting with, whether that's the course material, the lectures you attend, talks, etc. But today I'm going to try to give you some practical advice that hopefully you can apply in order to discover what it is you may want to pursue and research yourself. First, as I said, is going beyond the reading. And it's not just about doing reading outside of class. I want you to be very careful about checking the footnotes as you're reading. Start asking critical questions about the things that you are reading. Don't just read to regurgitate information in order to participate in class or to do well on an exam. You want to be able to harness that knowledge and figure out if there is something that you can contribute. The next thing is to expose yourself to various influences. In undergrad, I was a history major with an African American studies minor. And a lot of the courses that I took related to African American history, the history of slavery, critical race theory, etc. I also took classes on gender and women's studies, particularly looking at the history of sexual violence and the various theoretical frameworks used to study acts of sexual violence and human rights violations. But on top of that, I went to museums with my friends. I also try to expose myself to YouTube videos, different public lectures and all of those things because as you start exposing yourself to things beyond the classroom, you'll begin to form ideas and look at the thing that you were studying critically and from a different lens. So not just taking an American Revolution class, but also looking at the American Revolution from various points of view. So for example, taking a Native American history class, taking a class on women's history, taking a class on slavery, etc., will allow you to garner multiple points of view about a single subject and which may impact your thinking and may lead to further questions. The next thing is to communicate with faculty. So obviously going to office hours and talking with your professors is important, but come to them with questions and things that you are interested in studying further because they will let you know whether that is a viable project, whether they have sources that they may recommend, or if they even think that they might want to do an independent research project with you, which is the case that happened with me. Making sure that you are having conversations inside and outside of the classroom with your professors, with other students, attending events and exposing yourself to various points of view is going to allow you to develop different ideas, questions which may eventually lead to a project. The other thing is to start getting involved in other people's research. So for example, if you can get involved as a research assistant for a professor or a graduate student, that is another way to gain experience within research, which may lead to you developing your own questions. So again, just going back to my point of exposing yourself to as many influences as possible will allow you to develop your ideas around your methods and the sources, etc. So the second thing we're going to talk about is the literature review stage. And this is a video that I would like to make separately as well because literature reviews, historiography papers, etc. are one of the most important pieces of literature that you are going to produce as a student, specifically as a graduate student. Literature reviews are made to track trends and arguments throughout the scholarship in order to then make your own contribution. So seeing where there may be gaps in the reasoning or the methods or if there's a different way to look at something, if something's missing from the literature, then being able to do that landscape assessment and then see that that hasn't been filled by someone else allows you to then go forward and say, this will be my contribution. You want to look for things such as the improper use of a source or evidence. Say, for example, there was a broad generalization made by a particular scholar 
or if for example there was some influence within that scholar's field with whether that be the political or economic climate of the time look at how that may have affected their writing those are the things that you're going to want to include in the literature review i'm not going to go super in depth on how to write the literature review section just because i would like to make other videos about this because it is something that would probably take me far too long to explain and would make this video an hour long. But essentially what you want to do is track those trends and if you can try to write it out. So grab a piece of paper and start mind mapping the connections between different ideas. If there is a particular trend among a group of scholars or say various trends, then you can track those and then you're going to want to make them into individual sections within your literature review section of your thesis or your dissertation. So this is kind of included within the literature review stage, but this is my advice on note taking and citation referencing. First of all, the readings that you often do in class are to be able to either develop your ideas for a paper or to prepare for an exam or to participate in class. But long term retention is not often something that you're thinking ahead about. But when you're writing a literature review section for a dissertation, it is very likely that you are going to reference that article, that book, etc. time and time again throughout your academic career. So if you hope to stay in academia, then note taking is crucial. You want to make sure that you were taking notes based on structured reading and critical thought. So if you want a guide or a workbook on how to develop that and how to read strategically, then I'm going to actually leave a structured reading workbook down below that you can use in order to begin this process. But as you start developing your own methods of research and data collection or literature review analysis, you'll develop your own style in order to develop your readings and your notes. But what you're going to want to do is make sure that you are taking note of the sources, the evidence, Evidence, the main argument, the supporting arguments, questions asked. And lastly, you want to summarize. One thing that I implemented while developing my undergraduate thesis, which I will keep as a method for myself and hopefully for future students that I teach as part of my workflow, which is not only taking thorough notes and making sure that you're collecting the quotes, which may be applicable in your thesis, but to also write yourself a book review. In this book review, it can be 250, 500 words, whatever it may be. And you may or may not want to send this to your advisor. Write a paragraph about the arguments, supporting statements, methods, theoretical frameworks, etc. But then make a second paragraph about how this particular work compares to what you are hoping to say. And this will develop over time, but I'm telling you, this will become crucial when you actually go to write later on. So read strategically, but also take your notes strategically. So that way you don't have to do as much work later down the line. The next piece is using citation software. Personally, I only use citation software in order to generate the actual citation. So anytime I read a book or an article, I will then import that reading into Zotero and allow that software to develop my citations. As a history student, we often use Chicago style citations, but what's good about Zotero or a processor such as Mendeley is that they will generate whatever style citation is commonly used in your field. So whether that's APA, Chicago, MLA, etc. It's going to be available in Zotero or in Mendeley. You can upload your notes into these programs. I personally don't. I just find the interface not super user friendly. I will do a video on how to use this more in depth in the future. And if that's something you would like to see, please let me know down below. I've been, it's been requested before, so I will get on it very soon. But I take my notes in Notion or I handwrite them and I upload them into Notion, but I just upload the file into Zotero so that way it can generate a citation. So that way I can pull it when I go to write. All right, the third thing we're gonna talk about is field work and research. So this is where you're gonna be looking at primary sources, you're gonna be doing your data collection, you're gonna go to labs, you're gonna go to the archives, whatever it is that you do in your field, you're going to often have to do field work that may or may not require you to actually leave the physical space of your university. For me, my archives are often in Virginia or the British Library or in Washington DC. So for that, you need things like travel grants. And this video doesn't 
cover that necessarily, but I just want you to know that you can request and apply for travel grants as an undergrad. I did when I was a junior and I actually managed to secure funding from my department to travel to Washington DC to go to the University of Virginia to speak with professors there as well as to go to the Library of Congress to look at the archives that I needed for my thesis. So funding is not just limited to graduate students. You need to look at various pockets of money that are available. And that's going to be your department. That's going to be other centers within the university, as well as beyond the university. You're going to want to look at other types of nonprofit organizations or government agencies that have funding and fellowships for students. So one piece of advice that no one ever gave me, and I think is absolutely crucial, is when you are doing field work or you are collecting data or you are collecting sources. For me, it's going to the archive and looking at specific manuscripts, sources, newspapers, etc. is to actually go beyond looking at the sources you think you need. When you're in the literature review stage, just make sure that you are checking the information and the sources that they use and see if it's something you may want to look at as well. But beyond that, you also want to create a list of sources that you're going to look at that go beyond what you think may be necessary for your thesis. I unfortunately wasted time and money by going to the Library of Congress and only looking at one source. I wanted to look at this one journal from a general in the British Army. And I just wish that while I was there, I had the funding, I had the time. I just wish that I'd use that time a little bit more strategically and also looked at other sources. I was in the archive, I was in Washington, I might as well have. And I think that that might have helped me more in the long run because I ended up not even using that particular document because over time the project evolved. And as projects do, you just want to make sure that you are doing a little bit more than you think is necessary because it may come in handy later on and you can always digitize it and hold on to it for a later project. So now let's talk evidence and methods. So obviously I just talked about sources and the way you collect them and doing field work. This is going to vary depending on your field, how you're collecting data, etc. But right now we're going to talk about methods. And the one thing that I will tell you and that I wish someone had told me earlier is that your methods are going to evolve. You think that you are going in with a specific question and that you're going to look at one particular source or a couple of particular sources and you hypothesize what you think your thesis is going to be about. And over time, you realize that the thing that you went in thinking was going to happen or that you hypothesized would happen oftentimes leads to a dead end. It leads to a dead end more often than not, mostly because as a historian, there's a lack of sources and those types of things. So you have to be strategic and crafty and use other methods. As someone that was trained as a social historian, I thought that the sources I had to use were primarily journals, records from farm books, looking at newspapers, those types of things. I didn't even think to use census records in order to pool data. But at the end of my project, I ended up using this one census record and data mining it in order to extrapolate all of these qualitative assessments about the motivations and movements of enslaved persons during the American Revolution. So with that being said, know that your methods are going to evolve. I thought originally I was going to be doing a qualitative assessment of these journals and newspaper articles and trying to extrapolate what the motivations motivations for enslaved persons joining the British would have been. But when I actually shifted focus and looked at the census record and used data, then I actually came a lot closer to my conclusion that I would have had I just gone down the path that I originally thought was going to be viable. So communicate with your advisor and make sure that you are using methods that actually suit the needs of your project. Next thing we're going to talk about is outlining and planning ahead. So after you have done a thorough literature review and you've talked to your advisor and you have a general idea of what you're doing and you have your sources, you have your evidence, and you think you have your argument structure, now it's time to outline. And this is to distinguish what your format is going to be and how your thesis or your dissertation is going to flow. I will say that every field has a slightly different way of formatting their dissertations or theses. For example, you may not have a distinct methods section in a history paper, but the introduction often will cover the methods, the sources, the literature review. So while the format may differ depending on your field, you want to look at what is standard and then try to follow that general format. So for history, I would say it's an introduction which strongly states your thesis and that may or may not include a literature review section. If you have a longer literature review section, that's probably going to be chapter one. And then for my thesis, I ended up writing the second chapter on my quantitative assessment and then writing the conclusion. So it was only two sections. For my master's dissertation, on the other hand, I ended up writing a 
literature review section generally in the introduction, but then writing another literature review more specifically on a specific topic in the second section, and then essentially writing a chronological piece on the evolution of this particular slave law. This is going to require you to talk to your advisor and to figure out what format makes sense. I can't really lay that out for you, but again, just figure out what flows naturally and whether that's chronological or thematic, you want to make sure that you are using a format that allows your argument to come through. The next bit is the writing and accountability section. This is why I started the dissertation working group over at Accepted, which allows students to get together to work once a week on their dissertations or on their theses. But having an accountability schedule with yourself, with your peers, and with your advisor is what is going to help you maintain momentum as you develop your thesis. Oftentimes when you're writing, there's also other distractions. You have other classes, you have jobs, you have teaching responsibilities, etc. So being able to prioritize your dissertation may seem impossible because the project seems so far out. But what you need to do is set aside time two, three times a week where you're specifically working on that project and making progress gradually. Everybody's going to have their own schedule, but obviously I'm going to give the advice, don't leave it to the last minute. But what you want to do is slowly be developing your writing and your arguments because it allows the space for revision and for you to communicate with your advisor or a peer reviewer as you develop your thoughts, which naturally leads me to my next point, which is revision. Everybody is going to have a different team of reviewers, whether that's just your advisor or other professors that you're working with, or you have a peer reviewer, or you have somebody that is a friend who often looks at your work. Whatever it is, make sure that you come up with a schedule where you are sending sections of that dissertation to your reviewer so that way you can start making progress and start incorporating feedback. I found that the best thing I could have done for myself when I was writing my master's dissertation was actually sending sections to my reviewer, so my supervisor at the time, because I tried to send her these large sections and one, it was burdensome for her, but two, I would get it back and be so overwhelmed because there would be so many edits and I felt like her comments early on could have been incorporated as I was writing, but because I held off sending things to her, it ended up piling up in the end. So making progress and sending periodic updates is more important than sending a perfect draft or what you deem to be a perfect draft. Now we're going to talk about what actually makes a great dissertation or thesis and how it is I got the highest honors on my undergrad thesis and a distinction on my master's dissertation. One thing that I've been told before is that writing a strong literature review or historiographical section is key. This is something I've worked very hard to develop in my own writing to making the historiographical sections very thorough. And that isn't just about the quantity of literature that I was reviewing, but the way that I was actually discussing them and putting them in conversation with one another. So making sure you have a strong literature review section is critical to success. The next piece is obvious, but clear and concise writing. Oftentimes people make broad generalizations when they write or they try to be too artful with their prose and it just comes across as disorganized. As someone that reviews applications and written samples for students applying to graduate school as well as to undergrad, I feel confident in saying that even the best students from the best schools still make these mistakes. Be clear, be concise, get to the point. And then the last thing that makes a very strong dissertation and which will land you a first class or a distinction is having a clear thesis that makes a strong contribution to scholarship. So being explicit about what your argument is, how that contribution actually is going to impact the field and using evidence to back that up. This is the one thing that I am the weakest on in my own writing is being strong with my arguments. It's actually gotten weaker as I've gotten older, just because as you start reading the literature, you start developing more imposter syndrome and thinking that you are not actually making a contribution. So the advice I'm giving you is advice I'm also giving myself, which is be confident in your argument, support it, stand by it, and make sure that it is clear and distinct and explicit. And lastly, you also wanna make sure that you are making a contribution. It is not just about making your personal mark, it is very much about contributing to the field so that future scholars can build upon that work. And that should be your motivation. While we all want to see our name in print and we may want to get published someday, the goal 
should always be that you want to contribute to public knowledge and that you want to hopefully improve the way that scholarship is produced for future generations. With that all being said, I have now rambled and given you as much advice as I possibly can in this short period of time. If you would like to see a more in-depth video on the literature review section or how to write a literature review paper or any other section within this video, please go ahead and let me know in a comment down below. I really appreciate your feedback. I know I talked a little fast in this video, but I had a lot that I needed to get through and not a whole lot of time to do it. So with that all being said, I hope you enjoyed this one. Please give this video a thumbs up if you did. And if you are not yet subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye everyone.